feel free to take over the screen anytime you want. Um, Anyas is going to talk. Actually, it's a clinic, right? So, you know, prepare, think about your questions, um, but on inclusion um, for people with disability in, in CCCM operations. Over to you, Agnes. Yeah, we can see your screen, perfect. You will need to, uh, I'm gonna end. You're still muted, Agnes. Do you see the unmute on the bottom left of your screen? Ah, Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, sorry for this, as I am not a tech person uh, at all. So, uh, as I was saying, I am part of the uh, global CCCM uh, support team at IOM as a CCCM and protection officer. And indeed, welcome to this uh, clinic session. Uh, the idea uh, was to uh, have a follow-up session uh, after the, the one we had on Wednesday on participation, um, accountability and inclusion and uh, provide you uh, with an update uh, on new initiatives ongoing on, on the participation of persons with disabilities in CCCM responses and, and beyond. Um, just before we start, just a quick poll uh, that I would like to make. If you attended the session of Wednesday, could you put a thumb up uh, in Zoom, please, so that I have an idea of an idea of who attended the session. I can't see. Yes, thank I'm you. Seeing a couple. Yeah. Yes, me too. Uh, thank you. Well, we're going to uh, to go through some key takeaways uh, anyway, and uh, you will be able to uh, to to listen to the recording also very soon. It will be available on the event uh, web page. So we just I just encourage you to to uh, take a look at it as it was a really interesting session, uh, very interesting uh, exchanges in the first part, uh, really good uh, field examples in the second one, and there was also a marketplace. So please uh, take a look at it when the recording will be available. Before uh, starting, I just wanted to, uh, to show you the disability community motto. Maybe some of you already know it. Uh, it is nothing about us without us. And I think it's really relevant uh, to our topic and especially when it comes to the participation of persons with disabilities in our responses. Uh, this is also below the a nice uh, camp management house, uh, inclusive of all the beneficiaries, and that's what we are trying to, to achieve. Regarding the, the session of Wednesday, uh, I, I wrote down a few takeaways that really struck me, struck me and um, feel free to add or comment uh, if I missed anything or to add in the chat uh, regarding these takeaways. So first, we, we discussed the fact that participation, accountability and inclusion were not linear processes that they are complex ones, uh, interconnected, related to human beings, um, and that these processes needed to be localized and contextualized. We also um, discussed the fact that people had to remain at the center of our uh, actions in their complexity and in their diversity. And this is particularly true when we uh, talk about persons with disabilities. The issue of uh, intersectionality 
was also uh, mentioned. It is a key one uh, in this field. Uh, persons are, are diverse in their uh, identities, age, gender, experiences, in their abilities, hopes and aspirations. We can identify ourselves in many ways and uh, we should, as humanitarian responders, uh, be uh, respectful of that and acknowledge uh, this fact. Someone also raised the issue of accountability, but accountability to whom? Uh, to camp leaders and representative only? or to the broader population and how we can do that. And finally, uh, another statement uh, really stayed in my mind, like participation was a right and not an obligation. For the second uh, part of the session, uh, we had a, a couple of very interesting field examples. The first one uh, was from Somalia. And uh, with the example of complaints and feedback mechanisms. We have so far uh, very few good examples of uh, CFMs that include data on disability. While this is something uh, that is considered really important if we want to understand better uh, the requirements, the specific needs uh, of persons with disabilities, what are the challenges that they face and how can we respond to that? So Maya was one of them and it was really uh, interesting to, to hear uh, Ben talking about it. He mentioned the fact that uh, to be accessible, uh, CFMs uh, needed to be available through a variety of channels in multiple locations. Uh, but first and foremost, we should also consult persons with disabilities to understand their preferences and how, how they, could, they can participate and provide uh, their feedbacks to the camp management uh, practitioners. In Somalia, they've integrated the Washington group short set of questions to be able to, to monitor the use of persons with uh, disabilities. Uh, maybe not all of you are familiar with this methodology and here I wanted to, to highlight uh, the Humanity and Inclusion training package. It was developed last year, it is available online and I will share uh, all the links uh, after uh, this session so that uh, you can take a look and uh, check what has been done. Uh, this methodology is a bit complex, I have to admit. And before engaging in large scale uh, attempts to do so, you really need to, to take into consideration uh, our uh, capacity, our analysis capacity of this data, and most importantly, the use of this data. If we don't know, or if we're not going to use it, uh, maybe it's maybe not uh, recommended to, to embark in such an exercise. What I can tell you uh, is that it's going to be really important if we want to, to, to use these questions, the Washington Group Short Set of Questions. One important part will be to, to develop partnerships. Uh, in Somalia, they did it together with Humanity and Inclusion. There are other specialized organizations who can help and who can support, but this is something that should be really considered. Uh, this brings me to my second point uh, regarding the needs uh, for partnerships that was also raised uh, during these sessions. When we talk about partnerships, uh, of course, we will think about humanity and inclusion as we often come across uh, them and they are one of our key partners. Uh, but there are more, more organizations also like CBM, the Christian by Mission, who is also a specialized organization and can help us uh, set up more inclusive systems uh, in uh, our fields of interventions. When we talk about partnerships, I also want to, to raise the fact that uh, these days there are more and more efforts to build direct partnerships with persons with disabilities and their organizations. We call them OPDs, Organization of Persons with Disabilities, or DPOs, Disabled Persons Organizations. These organizations are uh, present in many contexts, in many countries. However, they're 
usually more focusing on development settings. They're not always uh, trained to or used to intervene in uh, humanitarian uh, responses. In this sense, uh, we have to be sometimes a bit proactive to reach out to them, but they can bring uh, a real added value to our responses, provide trainings on disability uh, to uh, our staff, raise awareness, uh, provide technical expertise on disability specific issues. So uh, this is something we are trying to promote. And when I say we, uh, it's not uh, IOM or the CCM cluster, it's like a global effort. Right now, the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy uh, Group is working on guidelines on consultations with OPDs. Uh, these uh, guidelines are still a draft, uh, but they are going to be released hopefully next year. So this is a global effort and uh, I just wanted to, to pass these messages uh, to you. Still uh, regarding the, the takeaways from the second session, the second part of the session, uh, the issue of persons with mental and psychosocial impairment uh, was also raised. We know that these people are often the most marginalized, uh, even within their communities, even within sometimes uh, within their families. Uh, the question on what can we do uh, is a really important one and there is no quick fix uh, so far. Um, what I can uh, tell you is that again, uh, think about partnerships. We cannot do it all uh, as uh, CCCM responders and partnerships can be really of help uh, in this situation. I also wanted to, to remind you of the IS guidelines on mental health and psychosocial support that uh, already exist and in particular the chapter uh, related to CCCM, what CCCM actors should know. Uh, these all guidelines are already available uh, on the IS website and can be also of help to, to go further on the topic. As someone already mentioned also on Wednesday, basically many tools are already here, they exist. Now we need to, to apply them uh, at our level. Finally, the last takeaway that I wanted to mention here is related to, to the need to, to create more safe space for people to, to engage with CCM actors. Not only safe space, but space in general. Um, that was uh, a point raised by uh, our colleague from War Child, uh, talking about the, the adolescent uh, in Syria, in, uh, in Jordan, sorry and uh, how uh, they were ready to engage with uh, camp management actors, but the NGO struggled to find the right channel to engage uh, with the camp managers and uh, also in uh, supporting the engagement of these youth groups within pre existing structures uh, in the camp. So this is also something that we should all reflect on as CCCM practitioners and how we can support them and uh, create this space for them to engage. Regarding new initiatives, uh, I'm going also to, to introduce you briefly the, the guidance note we are, we are working on uh, right now uh, and the tools uh, that uh, will be helpful to, to support the, the inclusion and the participation of persons with disabilities in CCCM responses. Uh, this is an uh, IOM uh, initiative so far, but it will be made available and hopefully uh, useful to, uh, to all. Um, so they are uh, derived directly from the IS guidelines on disability inclusion. You may be already familiar with these guidelines. They were released uh, last year and um, after like two years of consultation and work. And so this is really the latest uh, key guidance that exists uh, on the topic. Uh, we want this guidance uh, note to be very operational and again geared towards partnerships and also then to focus on the how to. The tools that will be uh, accompanying this guidance note uh, are still uh, being developed. It's a work in progress. 
but the idea is to have the idea is to have some uh, related to the communication with people with different types of impairment. We noticed that one of the barriers to the participation of persons with disabilities was also related to our lack of confidence as humanitarian workers to engage with them. Uh, so uh, these tips uh, can create confidence among uh, the humanitarian workers, the CCM responders, and uh, hopefully will be helpful to, uh, to us and to our teams. Uh, some already uh, exist. Uh, they have been developed by the Women Refugee Commission, with whom we've been working also a lot over the past years. Uh, so uh, you may also uh, find uh, additional one uh, on the WRC webpage. Other tools will be uh, related on the involvement of persons with disabilities in the identification of barriers and enablers uh, to their participation. This reminds me again uh, of the disability com community uh, motto, uh, nothing about us without us. We must involve them in identification, in the identification of the barriers and the enablers. We will have also examples of uh, tools like uh, accessibility audits. These methodologies already exist. Some have been developed by Humanity and Inclusion, others have been developed by uh, CBN, the Christian Blind Mission, and other humanitarian partners. What we noticed is that they are not necessarily adjusted to camp settings. Um, so now we are working on compiling these resources and uh, trying to uh, add good practices for the implementation in a camp. And that can be uh, hopefully also uh, really helpful. We, there will be uh, guidance on the development of uh, IEC materials, uh, how to use easy read uh, formats, pictograms, uh, that can be also uh, useful beyond actually person with disabilities and for it can be useful for a wide range of person how to create inclusive IEC materials. Um, we will have lessons learned uh, from the field, uh, in particular from South Sudan, on the setup of disability committees uh, in camps, as well as, uh, yes, lessons learned, uh, what we should be careful about, uh, but also like good uh, practices. We will have recommendations on accessible CFMs uh, based on the pilots that are ongoing, uh, like for instance in Somalia, but I know that there are more also in Iraq, and a checklist also for monitoring our work. So um, this is what I wanted to tell you uh, today. Um, I cannot see the chat. I don't know if there are uh, questions or uh, comments. I'm happy to answer, but Please, uh, one, you will have to help me to, uh, to read them. Um, Absolutely. And uh, just before, uh, just to remind you also that uh, so these actions are aligned with the working group on participation in displacement of the global CCCM cluster. And then, well, you are more than welcome to join us to continue the discussion uh, in this group. Yeah, I, uh, Agnes, I think one of the comments from Jennifer also, I think the link to participation is super clear, but Jen's also pointing out that similar conversation was also in the localization day. I don't know if Jen wants to say anything um, particular about it. Hi, morning, everybody. And yes, I was just going to ask you to elaborate about your comment regarding the um, camp managers needing to create space to be able to engage on um, with local NGOs about um, disability inclusion. It seems really kind of similar to what we were talking about on the localization day about um, that there being kind of a hierarchy or a power dynamics that maybe prevents um, all organizations from being able to participate in the same way and engage with the kind of CCTM actors. I'm thinking particularly about um, contexts where there is a, a very vibrant civil society and maybe you could just um, add a few remarks on that. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. 
Yes, uh, this comment was uh, was made by uh, our colleague Sophie from uh, Watch Child, but that's something we we came across also in a in a number of uh, settings uh, when it comes to persons with disabilities and uh, their representative organizations. Um, they uh, they try to they, they are willing to engage. Not all of them, of course, but they are willing to engage. But often uh, we will need to accommodate some of uh, their requirements. Uh, when I talk about uh, accommodation, uh, first we have also to reflect when, and I, when I talk about space, it can be physical space. Are our meeting points accessible to them? Physically accessible, I mean. Can they attend? Can they join us? Can they join a camp meeting? Can they join a camp committee meeting? Uh, do they have, do they understand? Uh, is the information provided in a language that they can understand? Uh, do they have time? Do they have the capacity and the training uh, needed to, uh, to be able to meaning, meaningfully engage? So it is related to, to a, a number of levels, and um, I think that we should be, as practitioners, mindful of the different abilities that we have in a camp and try to create, by all means, uh, this space, whether physical, uh, environmental, uh, but also in terms of uh, confidence, uh, in terms of training, in terms of skills, so that uh, so that all groups can actually meaningfully engage. And we, we have this also uh, responsibility, I think. Uh, are there more questions? Sorry, thank you. I also just want to point out that Kavita has very kindly been also answering some of the questions in the chat. Um, Kavita, I don't, do you want to come on and say something? Um, no, I mean, just to say that the session on Wednesday was uh, great um, and it was great to listen to what's happening uh, on the ground, especially in Somalia. And uh, thanks for uh, Agnes for summarizing it. Uh, what I said um, and, and completely agree with Agnes, it's not necessarily, um, we, we keep saying uh, coordinate with uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, engage people with disabilities. Uh, work with NGOs who have expertise on the issue, but it's not necessarily that clear how to do it and, um, and how to engage them. And just to let you know that there, there, there are two things that could help. So the first one is probably from a more institutional level, there, there, there are significant moves to get uh, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities engaged in uh, the HPC process um, and within ICCGO, the intern, uh, uh, the interagency cluster coordination groups within humanitarian settings. So how do we be more inclusive of them at that level so that they're making uh, wider decision making on, on general contribution of aid in certain settings? And then on, on a more local level, the IS guidelines have the chapter five, which have a section on how to engage with organizations of persons with disabilities, including a really good, some really good tips on what to do if there aren't any organizations of persons with disabilities in an area. So, so what do you do? And that's something that frequently comes up, perhaps not at, if you're in a capital of a, of a city where you're, a capital city of where you're working, but perhaps in a more rural areas where these kinds of organizations just don't exist. So that's, that's helpful. And then, then the second thing, was uh, that I mentioned in there was on what Agnes was saying about communicating. Um, so she, Agnes talked about the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy and the participation guidelines. They're also in the works uh, communication guidelines, uh, which uh, we've been helping to draft. And those have great tips on how to uh, communicate with people with disabilities. So that can be integrated into community feedback mechanisms, et cetera, and communicating with communities. Um, and then the last thing perhaps is, is just um, uh, when we're looking at barriers that people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities face in, in, uh, in whatever setting you're working, obviously the, the fact of communication is extremely important. The issue of consent is really important and how, how do you get consent from, from persons with those kinds of impairments to uh, agree to participate in the activities you're doing. 
And then the last thing is that really don't forget that attitudinal barriers are extremely significant. So how do you, how do you work on changing attitudes that people have towards people with those kinds of impairments? And that should be factoring in, uh, in, in whatever our communications and engagements are. Thank you, over. Thank you. Um, yeah, and just to add uh, again, and as it was stressed uh, on Wednesday, there are many initiatives ongoing. There are many uh, tools that are already available. Some are still missing on this engagement with persons with disabilities. We are working on it. Several organizations are working on it. Um, and then, related to a question that I see here regarding the space in camp setting to accommodate just the vulnerable female population or should there be a space for men too. Um, just it reminds uh, us also again of the diversity when we talk about person with disabilities it sounds really impersonal we're talking about men, women, boys, girls they will identify uh, differently uh, and so we need to take into consideration this intersectionality and then indeed uh, the needs of women with disabilities will be probably very different from the need from men with disabilities. When you talk about person with disabilities, it includes a whole range of disabilities, physical, mental, psychosocial, uh, visual impairment, uh, hearing impairment. So it's not just a block. We can't think and uh, develop our actions like for persons with disabilities as if it was only one category. Uh, our reflection has to go beyond this and our actions too. Well, thank you very much, uh, Agnes and, and Kavita. I know you have a few more minutes left in your time slot. Um, I don't know if anyone else have any question for uh, Agnes. I see a comment from Ingrid um, and Alex. Um, Ingrid is saying that they recently piloted a basic, um, like people with disability inclusion checklist for site managers um, and assessment rollout in camps. One of the components highlighted is on capacity building on inclusion, not only for camp managers, but also for camp committees and the communities and, and the caregiver. I think mm -hmm. on, the participation day is also interesting because there was a question around also people, you know, that basically you need to communicate with them through caregivers um, and not always directly for, to, with the people with disabilities. Um, and also, I guess that they will need additional support also as, as caregivers. The role of caregivers and families are, are extremely important when it comes to persons with disabilities and they also should be part of our uh, efforts. Then in some settings, uh, we have also to be mindful that uh, caregivers and families can be also part of the barriers. So just to make sure that we, uh, of course, they are involved and of course we have to work with them and uh, they are our best allies sometimes but we need to, to make sure that the person with a disability remain at the center of our action. And thank you, Ingrid, for sharing. This is very interesting. And as you can see, there are more and more uh, examples of actions uh, in this direction. And so you, you're probably uh, already familiar with some of them. Um, and the issue of awareness raising and capacity building in communities uh, is also extremely uh, important as the issue goes beyond only our approach to disability, but it's like a society, uh, whole of society one and discrimination around people with disability uh, need to be tackled by raising awareness and training uh, beyond uh, our own teams. Uh, thank you very much, um, Agnes. I see Omar, please do feel free to type in your, your question. Um, Anja is staying with us for a little bit and